Um, Dean Baker is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. Uh, he previously worked as a senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute and an assistant professor at Bucknell University. His blog, Beat the Press, features commentary on economic reporting. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. He's well published and um, he, has, he has a book called Getting Prices Right, the Battle Over the Consumer Price Index, which was a winner of a Choice Book Award. Diane Rogers is Chief Economist for the Concord Coalition. Uh, she recently joined the coalition as the organization's first Chief Economist, as well as their first blogger, EconomistMom.com. She was Chief Economist for the House Budget Committee from January 2007 to April 2008, where she served Chairman John Spratt and other Democratic members of the committee. In 2006, she was research director of the Budgeting for National Priorities Project at the Brookings Institution, and while at Brookings, she published several opinion pieces emphasizing the importance of fiscal responsibility and a paper on reducing the deficit through better tax policy. She also participated in the Concord Coalition's fiscal wake-up tour along with now former U.S. Comptroller General David Walker and scholars from other leading think tanks. She also teaches, you teach at George Washington, right? I do, yeah. Okay, she's at George Washington University, so you can see more of her there. Okay, I just have a, let's start with just some general questions, and I just want to know, um, let's start with Diane from the Concord Coalition. What's been happening with the fiscal wake-up tours, and what are your experiences at those um, meetings, and what are you hearing from the people who participate in them? Um, the fiscal wake-up tour goes on. Uh, we're actually just starting what we call at Concord phase two of the fiscal wake up tour, which is um, a little bit more focused on t just starting to discuss solutions. Um, you know, we spent the past few years really emphasizing the problem and the agreement among people of diverse perspectives that it was a problem for our economy going forward. Um, lately, we're trying to steer the discussion a little bit more to can we come to agreement among people of diverse political and ideological backgrounds? Can we come to some agreement on how to, how to start to close the fiscal gap over time? So uh, we're also involving communities a bit more. We're working with uh, local business and uh, government communities to try to um, get feedback from all kinds of different people, students, professors, business leaders, about uh, sharing ideas, their ideas for going forward and how we can start to turn this around a little bit and boost our saving both publicly and privately and hopefully get back to living within our means. And Dean, tell us what the Center for Economic and Policy Research has been doing to inform citizens about the national debt and other issues related to the economy. Well, we've been doing our best to try and let people know that groups like the Concord Coalition and movies like IOUSA Today are fundamentally misinforming you. That basically the long-term budget problems are health care problems, that we desperately need to fix our health care system because the United States pays about twice as much per person for its health care as do people in other wealthy countries like Canada, Germany, United Kingdom, pick your country. And if we don't fix our health care system, we're going to have enormous economic problems regardless of what you do with the budget. You can get rid of Medicare and Medicaid altogether. We're going to face enormous problems. If we do fix our health care system, then the scare stories you saw in this movie go away. So what we think it's really important, and we've done our best, we don't have a billion dollars like the Pete Peterson Foundation, so we don't have the same sort of budget to promote you know, the, the alternative perspective. But we've been doing the best within our means. We work hard to try and get the argument out to point out to people that we have to fix our health care system. And if we don't, we're going to face very serious problems. But basically, the rest of the budget, you know, our Social Security system is just fine. Most of the rest of the budget, there's pork, which we should go after. But that's just, as you saw in the movie, actually, not that big a deal. Um, but really, we have to fix health care. That's going to be front and center on our priorities. I should also say we're out there trying to warn about the housing bubble, so we wouldn't be in the disaster we're currently in. But we were crowded out to a large extent by people like David Walker with his wake-up tour. Okay, um, I told you, I warned you, didn't I? <laughs> okay, um, what I'm going to do, Diane, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Um, I agree that health care spending is the greatest challenge we have in terms of our long-term fiscal outlook. It doesn't change the fact that we, are, we have commitments. We've, we've promised things through the federal government, through our programs. And at the same time, we haven't committed um, 
uh, we haven't made a commitment to revenue policy that's adequate to pay for to pay for those bills. Um, you know, at the Concrete Coalition and the Peterson Foundation, we are we're not telling these stories because we're trying to end entitlement spending. We're actually trying to tell these stories so that people realize that these are things worth paying for, and that no solution is easy. Um, even though I agree that health care costs are the main problem, I'm not that confident that we are going to be able to get a handle on that uh, soon enough to start closing the gap and avoiding these um, escalating interest costs. I mean, I'm a mother of four children, and I got involved in fiscal responsibility because I care about the future of my children. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm at the same time, I don't intend to take benefits away from my parents either. But I think that there are ways to um, start to um, recognize the fact that there is a mismatch between what we're, uh, what we want to spend and, and what we're willing to raise in terms of revenue to pay for it. And anything that we really care about that's very important to us in terms of role of government, um, my position has always been we should just be willing to pay for it. That's, that's all I'm asking is not to, not to eliminate programs, not to um, cut benefits from people who really need the benefits, but to look for ways to pay for them and always to be keeping in mind, um, is, is it really worth the cost? Um, if it is worth the cost, let's be willing to pay for it. So that's all I'm, that's my position. That's the Concord Coalition's position. We're not against bigger government, by the way, but if we're going to have bigger government, we should be willing to pay for it. Okay, speaking of who's willing to pay for it, um, one, of the, one of the questions that's in the discussion guide is what w would you be willing to forego either personally or in your community in order to help balance the federal budget? Is it fair to say based on the predicament we're in, that the citizens are in some way responsible or totally responsible. Who is, who is supposed to make these sacrifices and who is supposed to pay for the debt or things that will benefit the community? We'll start with Dean. Well, I'd say the vast majority, insofar as there's any issue about paying for, is has to come from the top end. If you look at the policies that we've pursued over the last quarter century, almost all the gains from economic growth have gone to the top end, like Pete Peterson. Um, you know, these were the big gainers, so insofar as there's anyone who has to pay for it, I'd certainly say that you got to start at the top end. It's pretty hard to tell people who've had almost no increase in, in their incomes over the last 25, 30 years that they should be paying more in taxes or forgoing this or that by the way of benefits. So I'm really hard pressed to tell middle income people that they have to pay more. I have no problem at all telling the Pete Petersons of the world that they have to pay more. And I should, I, I beat up on Pete Peterson for two specific reasons. One is that he, you know, funds his stuff. But the other is that this man has benefited enormously from a, a major tax break in, in, in the tax code. There's uh, something known as the fund manager's tax break. Are people familiar with it? Can see a show of hands? Okay, a few, a few of you know this. It's a great story. Fund manager's tax break, what that means is if you run a private equity fund or hedge fund, you could have most of your income taxed as capital gains, at the capital gains rate. That's 15%. Now, many of us who are middle income earners, we pay taxes at a 25% rate. So Pete Peterson, who I'm sure in some years has made over 100 million a year, he'd be paying tax at a 15% rate Whereas I'm paying tax on my income, which is, you know, a few orders of magnitude lower at a 25% rate. Now, Peterson goes around the country. I've heard him say this many times. I don't need my Social Security. And I kind of love that because I go, well, sure, if I got hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks, I wouldn't need my Social Security either. Um, I totally agree with Dean. That um, I think that uh, the way we pay for it is we start um, collecting more in taxes from the very richest in society. Um, the Bush tax cuts gave away most of the tax cuts to the rich. And uh, very early on, I worked for the Clinton administration at the end of the administration and have always hated the Bush tax cuts, to be honest. That's not Concord Coalition speaking. That's just me, Diane Rogers, speaking. Um, I, um, I think that there is a recognition that whether we do it on the tax or spending side, that distributional concerns are at the forefront, that there are ways of cutting back on um, 
on entitlement spending in ways that don't affect the middle class. I mean, a lot of um, the people on the wake-up tour agree that the way to do it is to say, do we really have to subsidize health care for people like Bill Gates Sr.? Do we have to um, give a tax break to people like Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett said he's willing to pay more in taxes. Actually, Pete Peterson has said he's willing to pay more in taxes, too. Just because you're rich doesn't mean that um, you are uh, for policies that keep um, exacerbating the income inequality that's in the system or that you're not willing to pay your share in terms of your fair share in terms of taxes or reduced benefits. I should just mention quickly, Pete Peterson went down to Washington to lobby against the repeal of the hedge man fund manager tax break. So at least that one he doesn't think he should pay. Okay, <laughs> one more question and then it's your turn. Um, and this is a question, now you're at a disadvantage, Diane, because I've talked to Dean before <laughs> from the last screening, so I'm going to ask a question he's heard before. Um, is there good debt and is there bad debt? Can I answer yeah, first? You go okay. Um, I think there is good debt and there's bad debt. Um, the problem I have with the debt that we've been running up, especially since 2001, is that in my mind a lot of it has been wasted in the sense that um, we gave away a lot in tax cuts that went disproportionately to the rich. They weren't things that I thought would help grow the economy over the longer run. Um, good debt and worthwhile debt is um, on spending that will go for things that will actually increase our means in the future. So it would be one thing if we borrowed money to invest in education, in better health care, in infrastructure, in the environment. But that's not what we ran up the debt for. Um, and the other problem is that, um, so in other words, we've put all this money out there. We owe it, by the way, mostly to, to foreign investors now, which is another disturbing part of our, the trend in the debt since 2001. Um, we've, uh, we've managed to live beyond our means over the past eight years. Um, by borrowing at relatively low interest rates because foreign investors have lent us the money. But the problem is the bill doesn't go away. The debt is just passed on to our children and grandchildren. And meanwhile, we haven't spent money on things that will help my children uh, earn a higher income to be able to pay those bills in the future. That's the problem I have is that the debt was not done for good reason. It was not worth the cost, in my opinion. Well, I actually largely agree with Diane on this in the sense that, you know, obviously there are constraints on how much debt we could have, and debt can be improved for better or worse purposes. So if we're, you know, building up debt because we're cleaning up the environment, educating our kids, I think that's debt well worth, you know, accruing. Um, one point I would make is that, you know, we have to focus our benchmarks right, and to my mind the benchmark is keeping the debt to GDP ratio from rising. In other words, our debt level shouldn't be rising relative to our income. So I have a basic story here, you know, Bill Gates, he can go out and borrow a billion dollars and that's not a big deal to him because he's got 50 billion or 60 billion, whatever it might be. So that's not a big deal. Now for anyone here, well, I don't know everyone here, but you know, for most people, a billion dollar debt would be a really big deal. So, so, so the point is that, you know, the amount of debt we could have depends on our income and if our income goes up 3% a year, we could let our debt rise 3% a year. I mean, I wouldn't mind if it came down a little bit, but in any case, that, that should be our constraint. Now, the other point I'll just make, I think this is important that, I, because again, I think the movie conflates a couple things here. Our, our trade deficit is something that worries me very much, but that's different from our budget deficit. Our trade deficit's caused first and foremost by the high dollar. And the logic of this is fairly straightforward. The high dollar makes imports cheap. Now, I don't know anyone who ever, you know, they're in Walmart or wherever they might be, and they reach on the shelf and they go, oh, you know, I buy the domestically produced good, but because we have a big budget deficit, I'm going to buy the foreign one. The reason why people buy the good made in China or India, wherever it might be, they buy it because it's cheaper. And why is it cheaper? Because the dollar is really high. So our trade deficit is a function of the fact that we have an overvalued dollar, which I think is a very, very big problem in the economy that ha was not carefully discussed and probably quite confused in this story. And that's really independent of the budget deficit. So I, would, I think it's very important we get the dollar down. There's a longer story I could tell you how that's likely to bring the budget deficit down also. But I think we suffer from a, a very bad, you know, I sometimes refer, I talked about the stock bubble in the 90s, the housing bubble more recently. The third bubble is, is the dollar bubble, and that one's yet to burst. Okay, we're going to give you guys a chance to jump in. And please feel free to ask even the simplest questions because um, we're not looking for experts to 
to ask questions. We're looking for people to ask questions, and this is a good opportunity. So Nick is going to take the microphone. I only see one hand. I'm going to go to him first. Oh, a few hands, huh? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Wow, sorry, <laughs> please. Um, where do I start? <sighs> Let me say that um, one of the three things that was mentioned in the, the film um, about the, um, the fall of Rome, he mentioned that one of them was the overexpansion of the military. And some people may know that the United States military budget is more than all the other countries on the entire planet combined. So I think that we need to start a military budget cut. And a lot of the good old boys feel that, you know, in order to hold on to America's top spot as the last standing superpower, like some, you know, um, draconian continuation of manifest destiny or something, I don't know, but um, what, what, what should we be really be um, fighting for? Because um, this is one of the reasons why I'm a war tax resistant myself, you know. Um, and I haven't seen in anywhere in my study of history where the people that created the problem solved the problem. I was saying that to a friend here at the table. It's like, you know, when you violate by the police and then you're supposed to go submit a complaint with the police. I don't understand the rational, uh, rationale behind this. So I really like to walk out of here with a clear understanding of what I, as an individual, should be doing, should be fighting for, or what have you. And um, with this um, new administration coming in, you know, what, sh what leverage should we have and what exactly should we be asking for? And um, paying more taxes definitely is not something I'm, I'm, I'm interested in doing. Um, well, I, um, you know, I agree that we, we do spend a lot in our country on, on defense, but um, as the movie pointed out, and you know, no matter what you feel about the war and the cost of the war and the tax cuts even, um, the, the movie was focused mostly on the longer term outlook going forward. Um, I guess a lot of us are optimistic that, uh, you know, war costs won't go on forever and that um, the tax cuts don't necessarily have to go on forever either. But what we are committed to is taking care of our dependent population going forward. Um, we're a society that believes in supporting um, retirement in terms of retirement security and health security. Um, I don't think that's going to change. I think we're a compassionate society and we'll want to keep, um, thank you, uh, we'll want to keep that uh, support going, that government support. Um, so so the, the reason why we focus on the long-term challenge is because it's very hard, um, it's a very daunting challenge in the sense that we have a larger population of retired uh, elderly population relative to working age population coming up. It's something called the baby boom generation. We've known it was going to come for a long time. Ever since the baby boom generation was born, we figured out it was going to have a, a, a big impact, especially when the baby boomers didn't continue to have as many kids. Um, and I think that coupled with the fact that health care costs are rising so rapidly um, and that we don't really understand, we, we're going to do our hardest to keep those costs under control, but it's very difficult to, um, you know, it's the new, new territory for us. So trying to damp down government spending as a share of our economy I think is unrealistic. I think it's certainly unrealistic to keep it um, constant as a share of GDP. I don't think we would want to do that if we're a compassionate society. And so going forward, that only leaves us with uh, the uh, answer that, well, revenues are going to have to come up a bit too. I mean, we can try our darndest to keep spending uh, more stable, to damp that down, but the, it doesn't change the fact that there's already a mismatch between spending and revenues. And the longer and larger that mismatch is, the faster interest is compounding. And interest rates are, are going to head up in the future. Uh, they're not going to come down. Um, so as much as I agree that the, there have been some unfortunate policy decisions in the past eight years, um, going forward, that doesn't really help us with our biggest challenges. So what are our biggest challenges? What can people do? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing that's really easy to do. One of it is to signal to your politicians that you understand that there's a problem that we haven't been paying our bills. 
um, that you care about certain programs and preserving them, um, that you, there are certain types of government spending that you think is really worthwhile. Um, and when you say that, that you also say that you're willing to pay for those programs, that you think our society should be willing to pay higher taxes to support those worthwhile programs, but also that we should be looking at ways that we're spending money in the government that aren't worthwhile to our citizens. So if there is spending that you don't agree with, you have to be vocal about it, just like if there is spending you support, that you all should also be vocal about that. Because what this administration, what the Obama administration is going to have to take a hard look at is what are our priorities, what are we willing to do, what do we want to do for the American people, and how are we going to pay for those? Let me start. I'll come to the military in a second. But first, I just want to say something about health care and why I'm so optimistic that we can fix it. I just want people to understand what the obstacle is, and that's some very powerful interest groups. The main reason why I'm optimistic that we could fix it is every other country in the world has fixed it. And I've met people from Belgium and Germany and Denmark. They're not that much smarter than people in the United States. You know, they all pay much less in their health care, and they all live longer than we do. They have better health care outcomes than we do. We aren't that stupid. We could figure it out. We could have a good health care system here as well. And, you know, you just look at some of the things, well, our administrative cost, we spend somewhere around 30 percent of our health care budget goes to administrative costs, the cost of running the insurance system and all the people in doctor's office shuffling paper back and forth to deal with this claim and that claim and that claim. In Canada, it would be about a third as much, maybe even a little less than that. That's an obvious way to save lots of money. Drugs, no excuse for drugs being expensive. You know, you have prescriptions that you know people have to buy for $500, $1,000 a prescription. Go to Walmart. They sell for 4 bucks. What's the difference between the ones you get at Walmart? I usually don't promote Walmart. I will tonight. Um, what's the difference between the ones you get at Walmart for 4 bucks and the ones you pay 500 or 1000 for? A government patent monopoly. So it, it's not that they're different drugs are chemically distinct. It's just that the government will arrest people who competes with Pfizer. They give them a patent monopoly. Well, I understand patents are a way we use to finance prescription drug development. We could find much better ways to do it. We should be spending about a fifth as much. We spend $250 billion a year on prescription drugs. We could probably get away with spending somewhere in the order of 50 to $60 billion for the manufactured drugs and the research and probably end up with better drugs than what we get. Our specialists, some of the highly paid specialists, cardiologists, neurosurgeons, they could get three, 400000 a year. You go to Europe, you'll get people who are just as good and they get paid $150,000, 200000 a year. If our folks have trouble living on that, well, we'll get the people from Europe to come here and they'll be willing to work for those wages. You know, they'd be very happy to work for those wages. Which raises the last point about health care. If we didn't have such a protectionist Congress, it's so funny, they like to run around about free trade, free trade, free trade. I've put out a proposal, and I've never got anyone to take it seriously. It just says, why don't we let people on Medicare buy into the health care systems that have longer life expectancies than we do, and we'll split the savings. And I don't know how many economists I've showed it to me, and they all go running away from it. I go, what's wrong with that? Don't you believe in free trade? Well, they're protectionists. They believe that auto workers and textile workers have to compete, but they don't want doctors to have to compete. You know, well, if we can't figure out how to fix our system, let me buy out of it. What's wrong with that? Why can't I just buy out of it, go into one of the systems that's cheaper, and the government will save half the money and I'll put half of it in my pocket? What's wrong with that? Now, I think we should be able to fix our health care system because we're not so, hopefully, you know, we're not so stupid and not incredibly corrupt that we can't do that. But if we can't fix it, then let's go overseas. Now, the other part of the story, the, the, the military is a very big factor. You know, we're spending on the order of $180 billion a year in the war in Iraq, and you throw in Afghanistan. Actually, I guess that include, includes both, but that is a big chunk of the budget. It's about 1.2 percent of GDP. Um, I don't see any reason on earth why we shouldn't be cutting that back. Uh, how low you want to go, you could argue over, but there's huge savings. If we fix health care, we get the military down to size, you know, we're talking about, you know, our budget's going to be fine for many, many decades out. You know, it, you know, I think back about this, you know, these people warning about it. In, in 1983, we raised Social Security taxes. You know, it was a big increase. I've gone around a lot talking to people around the country about Social Security over the years, and I often will go, can anyone tell me the bad things that happened in, 19, in, in the 80s? And no one has ever mentioned that tax increase. It was a big tax increase. Now, suppose that 15, 20 years out, we have to have a comparable tax increase. No one's going to like it. But should we be running around worrying about that, that in 15, 20 years out, you know, in the early 60s, should we have told people, don't think about Head Start, don't think about Medicare, don't think about Medicaid, because in 1983, we're going to have to raise Social Security? That would be close to crazy. Okay. That's kind of the situation we're in here. Now, one last point, just I, I think that we'll be able to agree with me on this or not. We're in a really bad economic story. It's, you know, I've never seen, in my lifetime, we've never had 
had the economy fall off a cliff like this. We have to spend lots of money. Now, ideally, it won't be wasted, but the government has to spend lots of money because that's the only support the economy has. The housing market has gone through the floor. We've seen the stock market give up hope almost half its value in the last year. People are scared to death. They don't have money. They aren't consuming. No one's investing. The only source of demand left if the government spends lots of money. So at least for the immediate future, that's a year, two years, maybe longer, I hope not, we want big deficits. We want really big deficits because that's the only thing that's going to keep the economy going. And I think it would be really unfortunate if anyone walked out of here thinking, oh, no, we can't have a stimulus package because that would mean a big deficit. We need a real big deficit right now. I, I agree we need a big deficit. Um, you know, I, it's not that it makes me happy, but I agree that the economy's in bad shape, and when the economy's in bad shape, for, in terms of counter-cyclical policy, we certainly need to um, tolerate deficits, deficit spending right now. And um, I reiterate the point that um, we should make sure we're spending, we're deficit spending on the right stuff. Um, also, I, w I just wanted to point out that the, the reason to worry about things, even though we could push it off for a couple decades before we really were forced into action, is the cost of delay is that the interest keeps compounding. So um, that's sort of the financial cost of delay is that, um, you know, the interest continues to accumulate. Um, the this, this second reason that we really, if we have the political will or if we have a leader that is more committed to fiscal responsibility, the reason to do something sooner rather than later is that um, a politician like that, a leader like that doesn't come around all the time. And um, someone who can inspire the country to sort of um, you know, live up to their responsibility today rather than keep, it's always easy to keep postponing painful decisions, to, you know, to keep saying let's just um, add to the debt and let's just shift it to future generations. I just think that if we have the opportunity to reduce the burden on future generations by taking some action, some steps to close the gap today, um, that that's an opportunity we should we should grab when we have a nice a good leader who can encourage us to be fiscally responsible. I'm, I'm just going to ask that we have you reply once to each person so we can try to get as many people as possible. And if you want to add your what you want to see in the next reply, then that's fine too. So. I got <clears throat> two quick questions. Just one, I just wasn't sure the difference between your guys' positions. I, I think you hinted that there was a difference in argument or perception on this issue, but. I'm not sure exactly what it is, so I was wondering if you could speak to that. And also, just um, on the Federal Reserve, do either of you subscribe to some of the Ron Paul slash semi-conspiratorial view of the Federal Reserve? I was wondering if you could, is there a difference in perception on that? Well, I think our, our biggest, and Dan will correct me if I'm wrong here, I think our biggest difference is I basically don't think we have a big deficit problem. I think we have a health care problem if we fix health care. Basically, not to say there'll never be a problem with the deficit, but it's very, very much manageable. So that you know, other than health care, I think you know our budget is not hugely out of whack. I'd like to see cuts in the military. I'd like to see you know us retake the Bush tax cuts, and I think if we do that, we'll be pretty much fine. Um, as far as Ron Paul, I can't say I subscribe to that. I mean, the Fed has been horribly run. I think it's an undemocratic institution. I think it does need more democratic control. I don't see it quite in conspiratorial terms, though. I just think it was very badly mismanaged. They answered much more to the financial interest than they should. Um, but I don't see it quite in conspiratorial tones. I, I mean, what I would like to see is, yeah, I won't go into details about the structure of the Fed, but you could have much more democratic accountability in the Fed. Um, I, I don't want to see a huge overhaul of it, but it should be a more accountable institution. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with basically everything Dean just said. I think that our difference, it's almost like glass half empty or half full kind of thing, but um, I view, I view we have a fiscal problem. We have a, a fiscal challenge ahead of us, and health care spending is a large part of that challenge. Um, I think that we have to do more than just worry about health care spending. That's certainly a big part of it, but there's sort of a fundamental challenge that we have promised to do more than we can afford to keep in terms of those promises. So, um, yeah, if we could, if we could do a lot for the health to control health care costs, we should, certainly should pursue that. I think we should be pursuing other lines of, uh, of action at the same time because um, it's a big problem. 
and we don't know how well we'll be able to control health costs. I mean, the other reason why health co healthcare will always be unreasonably expensive, um, you know, in this country, especially in America, where everyone wants the best of everything um, immediately, um, it's always going to be unreasonably expensive, even if we're able to provide coverage to more people, because as long as there's still some private component to health spending, um, very rich people are still going to throw all the money they have in uh, means to care for their loved ones. You know, um, any anyone, it's sort of like spending money on your children. I, I always tell the story on my blog about how how I'm an economist, but when it comes to spending money on my children, I don't do the rational marginal benefit versus marginal cost thing. My, my exer mental exercise is, is there any positive marginal benefit, number one, that's my first question. Second, can I afford it? Not, you know, weighing the costs and the benefits, it's just whatever I can do to help my children, especially if it's violin lessons, braces, anything that seems to add to their future potential income, I will do it. And I think with health spending, I've talked to a lot of friends who have spent money on their loved ones when they were very, very sick and dying, and you just do not, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to weigh costs against benefits in that situation. If you can afford it, you will buy the most expensive, best possible care, even with small marginal benefit for the quality of life of your loved one. And I think for that reason, rich people will always drive a, a market that's at least partly private. And so it's, it, it's, it's not possible to, to think of health care as, as any other type of market any other type of consumer good. It's very difficult to think that Americans could be restrained in terms of their uh, desire to spend for the best for their loved ones. Hi. <laughs> wow. This thing is loud. Um, I did want to address in a question to both of you what you have just brought up. First of all, um, Ms. Mr. Baker, yes? Is yeah. that you were talking about buying into other countries' health cares. The Canadian health care system is on the verge of collapse. The British health care system is based on the middle income and poorer people have the health care that they can get. The richer people pay for theirs, as you were saying. Um, we're looking at choices. You were saying that you would pay the most to care for your loved ones. I'm a baby boomer. I'm the height of the baby boomer, right? I'm, not, I'm born in 1953. There were more of us in that year than any. And I see my mother, and if she goes into surgery one more time, she will be mindless for the rest of her life. I won't let that happen. That will be a choice that will be made. These choices do have to be made. And I, I hear these healthcare comments, and it's, there are times where you cannot rely on the government spending money well. We've seen it with the $700 billion we gave to Paulson, right? So we can't just say, health care. OK, we're going to give you $7 trillion. So what is the real solution? Your solution of paying half, you know, I'm going to go buy health care from some other country. Uh, lovely story. Your solution that you're going to pay extra for your children, lovely story. Of course you are. And I'm going to watch my mother die because she won't be able to afford the health care. So that's the question is, what's reality? When? How is this government really going to be able to take on health care as a reality? Well, yeah, I think the government has to if the government has to do better in terms of providing health care to people who need it but there's no easy choice there's no easy solutions there so in other words if the government decides they do want to expand coverage for health care more you know to to all people to provide some basic and essential health care to people to all people then they're going to the way they're going to have to pay for that is by not 
providing health care to people who don't need help with it, the rich people. So, you know, I mean, in other words, there's no easy s solution. You can't just say we're going to help provide health care to everyone and yet um, not inflict pain on anyone, not, not, not reduce benefits for any segment of the population. I think... You, you don't want your mother? <laughs> What's the problem then? What's the problem then? What's the problem? The government stops me. The government? Well, come on. We've got the case of, of the, somebody not letting somebody die in some hospital. But uh, I'd rather hear the answer. I don't need to talk. Sorry. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me say a couple of things. First off, in terms of Canada's health care system, I could find you articles in the New York Times for at least the last two decades saying it's on the edge of collapse. They run those every three years. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not terribly <laughs> concerned about that. Um, and if you don't like Canada, pick Germany, pick Italy, pick Spain, pick France, pick Belgium, pick Denmark, pick England, whichever. You know, there's a whole set of countries out there, all of which have longer life expectancies than the United States, and they cost an awful lot less. If you don't like them, you don't have to go there. I would like the option. So just tell these people, give me the option. I'll take my money and go there. No, they'd be happy to work out a deal. They would make money on it. I haven't found people that don't like to make money. If you find the people, show them to me. Um, so they would make money on it. Now, in terms of the cost of health care, let's be realistic. A lot of these things are really expensive because of the patent protection. So, you know, you go to get, you know, some scan test. You know, it's not how much you think it costs the hospital to put you in the scan device. They already have the damn thing. You know, it's, it's th that's right. Well, that's because of patent protection. That's the way in which you pay for it. So what you should do is pay for the research up front and have these things done at the marginal cost. I don't know how many times I happen, my wife has to, happens to have a chronic illness. We've had to deal with prescriptions. We have good health insurance, so they mostly cover it. But we have prescriptions that cost sometimes $1,000 for the drug. The drug doesn't cost $1,000. It costs 10 bucks, if that. It's because you have patent protection. We have an unbelievably backward system. And this actually creates all sorts of perverse incentives. This is Economics 101. If economics weren't such a corrupt profession, all the economists would be talking about this. You have you get enormous profits by selling these drugs for a thousand dollars a prescription that cost you four bucks to make. So what do you do? You lie to people. You say this is a great drug. You put on ads on TV. Tell your doctor to give you you know Vitalis, you know whatever it is, you know. So people do that because it doesn't cost them anything. Their insurance company picks up the tab. The doctor will prescribe because what the hell? It'll make the patient happy. This is unbelievably corrupt. It's all econ 101. But because the e economics profession is so corrupt, you get these guys who jump jump up and down if you put a 10% tariff on steel, but you have a 1,000% tariff in effect on drugs, they don't notice it. You raise it with the comments and go, oh, I never thought about that. You know, we have a horribly broken healthcare system because you have very powerful interest groups that don't want their interests challenged. Now, can we overcome that? I don't know. Pharma is incredibly powerful. The insurance industry is incredibly powerful. The doctor's lobbies are incredibly powerful. So it's certainly not easy. I don't take it for granted. But, you know, it's not because there's some inherent problem that we can't provide health care at a lower cost. The problem is political. I have have a question? Uh, given that uh, it's important for us to save to at least uh, have any impact on fixing this economy, how can we save if we don't have a comprehensive economic development strategy, the likes of China and India, and also that uh, we can, you know, with having such a strategy, deal with the problem uh, of accelerating um, jobs moving from o moving from uh, the U.S. to overseas, and also technological obsolescence, which you know basically replaces people with machines. Well, I don't mind. Uh, you know, we have productivity. I mean, replacing people with machines is something we've done forever, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That means in principle same number of hours of work, we get more things, or if you like it to put differently, I think this is great, people can work fewer hours, you know, which, you know, you go back long enough, people working 70 hours a week, we've had a 40-hour work week for some time. In European countries, it's common to have a 35-hour work week, people get more vacations, I mean, uh, you know, we want to take the benefits of productivity growth and more leisure, I think that's great, reduce pollution too. So that doesn't trouble me. Now, we do have a problem that you know, we have a hugely overvalued dollar, which, you know, as I say, let's say the dollar is 25% overvalued. That's basically the same thing 
as putting a 25% tariff on everything we export. We're taxing everything we export by 25%. We're in effect giving a subsidy on imports on the order of 25%. So I see a hugely overvalued dollar as a very serious problem. Now there are other things we have to do in terms of having a good development strategy, economic policy. We have to, you know, shore up our education system, build up our infrastructure. We should be focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And there's lots of things we could do, but, you know, we've done, I'd say we've really neglected a lot of very important policies, certainly over, you know, this administration and, you know, mixed record in the Clinton years. But, you know, we, we do have to do a lot of things to shore up economic growth, development, however you want to put it. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that. The um, most important thing we can do to boost national saving, and national savings is some of what the government saves and what the private sector saves, but of course it's difficult for people to save, government or private sector, if you don't have um, the income, if you don't have the job. I mean, right now it's not, uh, you know, we're talking about the crisis that's occurring in our economy right now, and everyone's sort of been forced to think about living within our means a little bit more. Uh, the problem is right now it's it's impossible for people to actually say very much if they're losing their job. So, um, you know, I think one of the most important things going forward is to make sure we're investing enough in human capital. In other words, that people are being educated um, and that we're investing in our future enough so that um, our younger people are going to have good jobs going forward so that they will be able to save and they will be able to keep contributing to economic growth going forward. Yeah, uh, hello. Um, one thing I don't hear much about is uh, Social Security originally was designed as an insurance program, which I get Medicare and Medicaid, well, Medicare also is. But um, nobody seems to be talking about the fact that it's an insurance program designed to keep people out of poverty. So you have these fat cats that are getting these checks who have, have no need for the money. Uh, what, number one, what are your thoughts about that? Are they actually sending the money back to the Treasury? And then number two, uh, what can a typical person on the street do to influence this situation? Well, in terms of the fat cats who get their Social Security, the people who are in that category, if they all sent their checks back, you know, we wouldn't even have to change any of the numbers in the projections because it's such a small amount of money. There just aren't that many people in that category. I know Pete Peterson likes to make a big show of that, and I encourage him to send his check back if it makes him feel better, but it won't affect the, the story. Um, the second thing is, you know, it bothers me every bit as much as Pete Peterson getting the interest on his government bonds. He probably doesn't need it, but he paid for it. So these people paid for their Social Security. I, you know, that's, you pay in, you get something back. It's a very progressive payback structure. So, you know, the, the uh, ratio of what Pete, Pete Pete Peterson or Bill Gates will get in their Social Security relative to what they paid in is very low. The what payback for someone who worked at minimum wage jobs intermittently because you know bad health or whatever reason they get a very high payback. So it's a very progressive structure. So it bothers me not at all that you know these wealthy people get their their social security. They paid for it. As I say, it bothers me as much as you know what they get by way of uh, interest on government bonds. Last point I should just make on this is you know if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, their most recent projections show that the program social security could pay all benefits with no changes whatsoever through the year 2048. So that's, you know, 30 years after President Obama, the last day President Obama could possibly leave office. So it's not, uh, you know, somewhere down the road, if, you know, those projections prove right, we'll probably have to make some changes, either cut benefits in some way, raise taxes in some way, but we have a long, long time to go. I think Social Security does serve a very useful insurance function still, and maybe we're even more aware of it now with what's been happening in the stock market. So, um, you know, I think that it is very important that people have that as a, as a, as a sort of minimum amount of retirement support. Um, but I also, I also happen to think that um, there is a shortfall going forward over the longer run, and um, pers personally I don't think it would be a bad thing to structure the system even more progressively than it is currently if we were trying to address the shortfall. Um, this has to be the last question. Yeah, I, um, I had a question. Um, uh, are you familiar with Barbara Erin Reich? Uh, yeah. Maybe pronouncing her, mispronouncing her last yeah. name. But she authored a couple books on the subject, uh, Bait and Switch and Nickel and Dime. There was a very fascinating article I read uh, not too long ago. It was entitled, uh, I believe something to the fact of using education as a scapegoat. I would encourage anyone to Google it, look it up, 
that article was extremely deep. It was very brief. But what she pointed out in the article was oftentimes how politicians will say, oh, all we need to do is educate people and we need a more educated class and da 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 You always hear that, how many uneducated people there are and if we just had more people with bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and PhDs, everything would be, you know, honky dory. Well, basically what she did in great detail uh, was boast that lie that actually there are too many people with college degrees and the economy really doesn't produce that many college uh, college uh, level jobs. And so what you have is you have a lot of over-educated people that are working under uh, jobs that they're overqualified for. Um, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I can tell you right now, I'm working on a second master's degree. And I'm not the only one that I've gone into. Uh, I already have a master's degree from Johns Hopkins. It's not a bad school. And I've gone in there and I've seen people, you know, from Ivy League, you know, um, uh, schools and whatnot, you know, much better pedigrees than me. And I'm just like, why are you here? I'm thinking to myself. And it's just really crazy how people get up and talk about how we need more educated people. And I just think that's a lie. I think that what's going on here is you have a very sh shrinking pie, shrinking economic pie. And a lot of people just keep beating that dead horse. Education just really rules me because I, I'm graduate level educated, working on a second graduate degree. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not making great money. So I don't buy it. Um, that's my two well, cents. Well, more educated people still do better in terms of, yeah, your degrees are probably worth something in terms of your job security and your um, the quality of your job. But I, when I say we, I think we need to invest more in education, I do mean it in a broader sense than just, you know, helping people acquire more degrees, um, you know, like going all the way to preschool education, you know, improving that and improving the quality of our education to our kids, not just to grown-ups collecting more graduate degrees. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to what you said, and again, Green Day, and with it, that, you know, when I was saying education, well, two things. One is just, as a general rule, people with more education do get better income. So if anyone asks me, you know, well, are you better off with another degree? Yeah, you know, odds are you'll get a better income. You know, no guarantee, but odds are, you know, in your favor. But secondly, you know, we do have a lot of people. It's not that I think we have this big shortage of people with college or advanced degrees, but we have a lot of people that don't graduate high school, you know, and that's a real serious thing. I mean, people have to, you know, get basic skills, you know, and that, that is a problem. It's a huge class dimension to that. I mean, it's a really, really big issue. So when I think of education, I mean, that's where, you know, my focus would be ensuring that everyone gets, you know, decent basic skills. Now, I will comment, I think this is Barbara Ann Wright's point. I've not read that particular piece, but I know some of what she's written, know her. Um, there's a, you know, there has been this enormous increase in inequality over the last three decades. And economists, at least a lot of economists say, well, there's been this shift in skills so that people with advanced skills, people with advanced degrees, those skills are much more highly valued now. Now, that's an argument that we need more people with advanced skills, you know, with college degrees or even more advanced degrees. I don't find that plausible, and I've been joking about this, that we're going to see a big change in technical, a big technical shift, you know, in the next couple of years because we're going to find that people at the very top end are going to get less income. Why are they going to get less income? Because a lot of those people at the top end were working at a place like Bear Sturman's Lehman Brothers that aren't there anymore. So I think you will see, to some extent, a movement towards greater inequality. That's going to be a positive benefit of this crisis, which, you know, on the whole, I'm not going to advertise as a good thing. But I think that will be one of the, the benefits out of it. I think the increase in inequality over the last quarter century has been overwhelmingly an institutional story, that you've seen things like the weakening of labor unions, the way that trade has been opened up, I think, has been very disadvantageous to, to less educated workers. So I don't think it's a story that, you know, we just need get people with more degrees and that will address inequality. Again, I encourage people to get education where you can. We have to definitely fix it for those at the bottom so they get the skills they need to be productive workers. But I'm not going to say that we have inequality because we don't have enough people with really high skills. Okay, that wraps up our community summary event for IOUSA. Please thank our guest speakers. <laughs>